Okay, so I'm very excited to be here, and I'm honored to be on the same panel as Bill and Anna. They're a pretty hard act to follow, and I promise you my lecture is going to be a lot more boring than theirs, okay? So my interests are pain medicine and addiction medicine, as well as the interaction of these two disciplines. Um, I really don't think we'd be here today discussing chronic pain and substance use disorders if not for the actual opioid ep epidemic rather than some other substance use disorder. As much as I find this, both these topics very interesting, not too many people care to listen until people started dying in fairly large numbers, especially white people, from prescription medications and eventually heroin. So while people of color, especially people who are color and who are socially disadvantaged, who are addicted to crack cocaine, who are being incarcerated long term in prisons who are privately owned prisons, while white folks who are doing the same drug but just in a different formulation, there was no national uproar when these people of color or socially disadvantaged people uh, were, get, were, were dying from their substance use disorders in the 80s and 90s. So I was asked to talk about non-opioid medications for treating chronic pain for patients who are diagnosed with a substance use disorder. I will talk about that, but it may not be until slide 50. I had about 300 slides. I weaned them down to 125, and yesterday I couldn't get to slide 83. So be rest assured that all these slides and all my notes are going to be available. So I'm going to skip slides, and I may not get to some topics. Um, so I'd rather give you an overview of other considerations when treating patients with using substance use disorders who also have chronic pain. Um, my, you notice my email address was on the first slide. And you're free to email me if you don't get those slides, and I'd be happy to forward them to you. So I'm going to assume that you know how to make a diagnosis of a chronic pain diagnosis. And if you don't, because clearly there are all kinds of different people in here, you have access to somebody who could make the correct diagnosis. And the same thing goes for a substance use disorder. So this is not always an easy task, clearly, and especially in some communities. So not everyone who looks like an addict who is on opioids. So somebody's on opioids, they kind of look like an addict because maybe their codependent physician made them look that way, or engages in problem bag behavior is an addict, although behavior does count. So my disclosures, I have no conflicts of interest. I do have lots of biases based on my life experience and my biases change with time as I learn from my good and bad decisions and those of my colleagues. So, I think we're all shaped by what we see in life, and, and this is not, I may have some, a little bit of narcissism is okay, so I'll tell you about where I came from so you understand why particular biases I have. So I happened to grow up in a kibbutz in northern Israel in the 50s, which was a war zone, and one of my buddies who were playing soccer stepped on a landmine and got killed, and I got injured, and so morphine was a wonderful thing, as I discovered as a young child. Flash forward to the 60s, I'm at Columbia University in New York, and I'm driving what may have been the only yellow cab in all of Harlem, and I kind of came upon the dark side of opioids, that's heroin, and this is when Bumpy Johnson was running Harlem, and if you've seen like American Gangster or Cotton Club, there's like a gazillion movies about, I never met the guy, but I've certainly met guys who were runners for him, both in numbers and, and, and addicts, or drug dealers. So while I was at college in New York City, I used to visit my aunt and my grandfather and my parents who were living at Brooklyn at the time. And my aunt was chief of pediatrics at Semmelweis in, in Budapest, um, and eventually became chief of uh, pediatrics in Brooklyn Jewish Hospital in Bedford Stuyvesant, which at that time kind of looked like Harlem, although neither of those places looked any disadvantage today. If you go through Harlem or Bedford Stuyvesant, it's really hard to afford an apartment. Um, and so many of the children she took care of had neonatal abstinence syndrome. So, and I would go to see her practice and I kind of got my little introduction there. But what really kind of freaked me out is when I came home one time and I saw there's a bottle of morphine in Aunt Charlotte's closet and I said, what's that for? And then I noticed that she would be regularly injecting my grandfather with morphine. And I said, what's going on? Well, I knew he had pain. They both were in the death camp, my Aunt Charlotte and my uncle and my grandfather and so was my, my father. But, you know, my father wasn't asking for morphine. He was disfigured, he was beaten, he was slashed, he was experimented on. Now, of course, he, had suicid he was suicidal every day of his life due to survivor's guilt, but that's a whole other story. So then I end up at NYU, and I got lucky, and I got into what's called an MD-PhD program, and I end up in a cognitive neuroscience lab that was run by Eric Kandel, who was a psychiatrist and went on to win the Nobel Prize in 2000. But I was really not interested in cognition. I was more interested in the emotional side of the brain. 
And many people don't know this, but his wife, Denise Candle, who was also a, a, a Jew from, the, from France who survived the Holocaust, was doing amazing work in addiction research, and I decided I wanted to be. Thank you. Thank you. Please keep correcting me, because I tend to like, move around. So just call, it, call me out. So I decided, rather than doing a medical internship at Bellevue, where I trained, and I really believed that internal medicine was the basis of all, all medicine, I decided to go to Beth Israel Hospital in New York because they had a lockdown facility called the Bernstein Institute, which was the first place the methadone was actually done, had clinical trials, and was done by Niswinder of Niswinder, Doyle, and Creek. Uh, the only person who left alive is a brilliant scientist. She's at uh, Rockefeller Creek, but that's where I learned a lot. So every third night, they'd lock the place down. It was like lockdown facility. So first floor was medical con consequences of addiction. Next floor was just alcohol. Next floor was opioids and heroin. Next floor was quaaludes. That was a big deal at the time. Benzos. Then we go up, you know, you've seen Elton John with the glasses, quay, right, right? And then there, was, then there was the psych floor. And of course, all night long, I'd be running up and down. Everybody had pain and they wanted something. And it was an amazing experience. And I, it, for whatever stupid reason, I decided to become an anesthesiologist and trained at Stanford because I was interested in the neural collars of consciousness and I thought I would find them in the unconscious. But that was my stupidity. So now, back in the Stanford in the 70s, opioids were king in the operating room. Any major surgery, and I was doing heart transplants with Norm Shumway, and it's an amazingly smooth anesthetic. Patients end up sleeping for a couple of days afterwards. Today we wake them up right away, not because it's better, because it's economically better. And so there's nothing as wonderful as large doses of opioids, and I discovered every opioid that existed in a 20-year period. Unfortunately, 25% of my physician's colleagues went on to develop a substance use disorder and have since died. And in, just as an aside, in my own practice, having worked in two other places, it's always been somewhere around 20% of my colleagues have some sort of substance use disorder. So pain medicine in the 70s at Stanford consisted of a little trailer outside of the Hoover Pavilion where we would do interventional pain medicine. And they'd give me a needle and said, if you got the right length needle and you put it in the right spot, you can solve all of mankind's pain problems. Rather, rather optimistic point of view. So at that time, we gave patients opioids for two, three days, and that's about it. Fast forward 16 years later, and I sustained a traumatic spinal cord injury. And I soon discovered that pain, in my case, it was neuropathic pain, is an unpleasant sensory and a very emotional experience. Um, that can lead to accident one issues, maladaptive behaviors, and that most of what I've been taught at Stanford, excuse me, was absolute BS. It took three years of self-discovery and support from my wife now of 44 years to rehabilitate myself physically and emotionally and to learn to accept my pain, kind of in the addiction literature, acceptance is a big deal, a lot of similarities between addiction and pain, um, without the need for others to fix me, responsibility, I gotta fix myself. So in 2006, I came back to Stanford. I started a tech company in the meantime and been out of clinical practice. Um, come back to Stanford, I get advanced training in non-interventional pain medicine because I've done thousands of interventions. I also lost my dexterity from my spinal cord injury. And if you paid me a million bucks per procedure, I wouldn't do it anymore. I was just shocked by the amounts of multiple long and short acting opioids patients were getting through multiple routes. Uh, concurrent high doses of benzos, carisoprodol, that's soma, antidepressants, antipsychotics, NSAIDs, gabapentin, gabapentinoids, and so, and so on. So about a year or two later, I went to visit a physician who later became president of the American Academy of Pain Medicine. I won't mention his name because I don't have nice things to say about him, although I actually like the guy. So at his office practice, and this was in Utah, which by the way, I happen to own a home in Utah, and a lot of Mormons have huge opioid addiction problems because they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't drink Coca-Cola, and they can go to their doctor and say, I have pain, and they now found something to modula modulate their dysphoria. So he's a brilliant and caring physician with multiple, and I say about 60 pharmaceutical industry conflicts of interest, who defended using 1,000 milligrams of methadone per day for pain, not for a methadone treatment program, and yes, pain, uh, and, and I was surprised that no one else noticed what I noticed was in plain sight based on my life experience. To me, his office looked like a methadone treatment program, which is nothing wrong, but that's what it was. It wasn't a pain clinic. So anybody see an arrow on this slide? So imagine there's a truck rolling by you and it's a FedEx truck, and so you see an arrow. I mean, some people do, you know, those of the enlightened. 
Well, how about now? Okay. So the whole point of this slide is you need to be extremely observant and know what exactly you want to look for when you're treating a pain patient, an addict, or a pain patient that happens to have a substance use disorder. So what are my biases? Opioids are neither good or bad. Patients are neither good or bad. I got to Stanford in 2006 and said, do you like this patient? That's, you know, I'm already an old man. I was 57, at the, 60 at the time, or whatever. And I'm going, why do I have to like the patient? You know, I mean, it's like I want to have coffee with them. I mean, I, I, in fact, the patients that other people don't like, I happen to like. Some patients benefit from opioids, some patients are harmed by opioids, and opioids can be prescribed competently and safely, although I'm not suggesting this is a benign thing, and that's not what I do. Um, so doctors who make a blanket statement that there are certain types of pain, like neuropathic pain, which I had, are just unresponsive to opioids. That's absolutely not true. They've clearly not been practicing pain medicine or prescribing opioids for any length of time, or not looking carefully at their patients, or just have a deep-seated bias against opioids. I happen to have a deep-seated bias against antidepressants, so having my father go through like 20 of them until he got shock treatment, right? So another bias is that of mine is that most of the, quote, evidence-based literature on the use of prescription opioids in general and on patients receiving opioid prescriptions who took them exactly as they were prescribed in decent, normal, what I would say, safe amounts, and then went on to overdose, and then the literature on the treatment of substance use disorders and recovery rates has a very high BS quotient. There's a brilliant mathematician at Stanford called John Leonidas, whose parents were uh, physicians, who now basically showed us that 44 of the most important medical articles that changed practice, 49% of them were absolute BS. I'm not talking about fraud, where the physicians actually, who did it, or the scientists, did their best to have a good study. So just think of the FedEx lo uh, logo. Don't ignore what you see in place sight from your own experience. So there's a fellow called Ramachandra, and I belong to the Society, American Association for the Study of Consciousness. I'm nowhere near as bright as Ramachandran, but he's a brilliant neuro neurologist um, who trained in England. And he'd like to do thought experiments. So he said, um, if I told you pigs can fly, and I could show you one pig that could fly, how many flying pigs do I have to show you before you believe me that pigs can fly? So, in, so my experience in observing addicts over the last 50 years has to have some value at least for me, when it conflicts with, quote, evidence base and that is very weak or just plain BS. So a very respected and expensive residential treatment center that uh, asked me to be their director, they boast of a, which I turned down, and they, they boast of greater than 80% recovery rate, and they have to have, happen to have a pain program, and they say that 74% of their patients leave pain-free. I've been practicing pain medicine for a long time. I've not had a single patient who's pain-free. They may be functional, they may be happy with their life, and certainly, nor I have been pain-free for the last 22 years. I'm very happy, but pain-free, absolutely not. So what are the objectives of this talk? And I think you need that for your CMA. Oh, the last thing I wanna say. While opioids can be prescribed safely, I educate all my chronic pain patients, whether they have a substance use order or not, to come off their opioids as a trial. So if it becomes their desire, not mine to get them off, to get off their opioids. That's the only way it works. Your patient needs the education to kind of believe your belief system. You can't force it down somebody's throat. So the objective of this course is describe the magnitude of the problem of chronic non-cancer pain, describe the principles of chronic pain management in any patient, not just patients with SUDs, discuss the role of medications in treating any kind of chronic pain disorder, not just patients with SUDs, discuss the nuances of chronic pain, of treating chronic pain in patients diagnosed with an SUD and articulate the importance of safety first, which I may not have time to get to. So, by the time somebody comes to see you with chronic pain, the biological issues are not as important as when they have acute pain. They really have serious psychological and social and spiritual issues. And the same thing goes actually for people with substance use disorders. So somebody comes into your office and they're on opioids. Nobody carries a label. You don't know the person who's actually got an SUD and chronic pain or somebody's got a chronic pain. My job, our job, is to figure out how each of these issues impact the patient. So whether they have rheumatoid arthritis, chronic pain, the disease of addiction, or actually a psych severe psychiatric disorder, or in my case, since I take patients, nobody wants all, all of these, okay? So control, control substances, including opioids, may be used by patients 
and unwittingly by providers in an attempt to mask or treat one of all of these issues. So the medical and psychiatric consequences of a substance use disorder, even if you're in recovery, are protean. So you must be proficient in balancing risk and benefit of any medication, any injection, any surgery, or anything you want to do with that patient that you're contemplating to treat any disease, forgetting about just, just chronic pain. So if a patient is actively abusing any substance or substances, you may be able to treat a broken bone, but you will face immense barriers that are biologic, psychologic, behavioral, and social in treating any disease when somebody's life is in absolute chaos. So you all know, uh, especially the, the primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, the importance of a patient-centered evaluation. But remember, pain is a first-person experience, not subject to objective measurements like vital signs. So it's important to remember what William Osler said. It is much more important to know what sort of patient has a disease. This is especially true for pain, and my wife does it all the time. This is especially true for pain and addiction. What many of you may not know that William Osler, who was the father of you know, medicine in the United States, and William Halstead, who he hired, who basically was a surgeon at Bellevue, where I trained, uh, he knew that William Halstead, if you watch the Nick, it's really based on William Halstead. Anybody see the Nick? Yeah. So that's William Halstead. So he was basically, if he wasn't getting 180 milligrams of morphine a day or getting cocaine sometimes injected into the dorsal vein of his penis because he had no veins left, the guy was not a happy camper, but William Osler said he's a great physician, but it only, you could only coast on being a great physician on those kinds of substances for some time and eventually had to go into rehab. So, so also make sure that you pay attention to what the patient is commuting verbally and via their body language and behavior. And I'm not talking about just pain behaviors because I have pain behaviors all, you know, I limp, I do all kinds of things. So I, I suggest if you have time, read a great book by a guy, a psychoanalyst who was born in Vienna called Theodore Reich. It's listening with a third ear. I learned about it from a guy um, called Jose Maldonado. So when I came back, he's a colleague of Anna Lemke. So when I came back to Stanford in 2006, I realized like, my patients have serious psychiatric issues. I don't remember psychiatry, so I spent a bunch of months with Jose making psychiatry rounds, and he told me, read this book. So basically, it refers to the practice of listening for the deeper layers of meaning in order to glean what has not been said outright, because what the patient doesn't say is just as important as what they do say. So the goal with any patient is to engage in a therapeutic relationship using a non-judgmental motivational interviewing site, uh, style, and when dealing with patients with substance use disorders, this is much more important. Give patients permission not to tell you everything on the first interview until they trust you as having their best interests at heart. Addicts, and I use that in a nice way, are very good at reading you, and it's hard to fake being non-judgmental. So one of my colleagues at Stanford who is brilliant, is a pain physician, sends me this patient, three Norcos, something is not right. Guy comes in, he looks a gentle giant. He is a tower but he's so sweet. And so I, I listen to him for about 15 minutes and I say, so when was the last time you shot heroin? He goes, you know, like five minutes ago outside before I came into your office. It's the way you ask that question that will get you the answer you're looking for, okay? So be, beware and you need to scrub yourself of any kind of prejudice and it's pretty subtle sometimes. So let's talk about definitions. Pain is an, un we talked about it. It's a, the most important word in that thing is the and, it's an emotional experience. It's actually, there's a typo there. Oh no, they fixed it, perfect. Okay, so frankly, if you don't believe your patient as they're describing their pain, you're in the wrong business. Now, I'm not a gullible person, but when somebody comes in and you saw that video from Anna, they're suffering from something. It may be addiction. To me, they're just as interesting if they're trying to cop some opioids from me or if they actually have real pain or something in between. So I don't know of any psychiatrist whose patients endorses all the vegetative symptoms of depression as suicidal ideation and say, no, nah, I don't believe them, they're not depressed, okay? So I believe all my patients until proved otherwise. So all of you who forgot your neuroanatomy, the fact that pain is not only a sensory and uh, experience, but also an emotional experience. If you remember neuroanatomy, if you look here, you notice this. So this is the sensory cortex, that's the limbic system. You can't have a drug, and that's why there's also, we don't have the nucleus accumbens and the reward system. When you take an opioid in your body, or you take anything with your body, or you have a pain symptom, the, your, your limbic system is involved. 
The brain is a meaning-creating machine. That's what I learned from, one of the things I learned from Eric Kandel. And we are hardwired to create meaning out of all sensory input. And that's, that meaning creates behavior and action and movement. So, nociception. Nociception is just an electrophysiological phenomena. It's not pain. Pain happens when it enters different parts of your brain. We don't know which part of your brain is where consciousness resides, and that makes it probably, we may never know, I think, with the brains we have as human beings, we may never find the exact spot. But again, no brain, no pain. <laughs> so now, since we discussed that brain is a meaning-creating machine, hypervigilance, catastrophizing, belief systems, expectations, said so happiness has always been reality minus expectations. Fear avoidance, depression, emotional context, gender, genetics, previous personal family experiences like my crazy neurotic family and me being neurotic as well with injury and pain are all integrated. My Aunt Charlotte thought that if you have one moment of happiness, something terrible is going to happen the next moment. Of course, she was in a concentration camp and I just grew up in Israel and it wasn't that bad. So I, I don't blame her for that kind of point of view. Now, um, that slide just speaks for itself. Circuits involved in drug abuse and addiction. All of these circuits, by the way, are also involved in pain, perception, and modulation. Gee whiz, why do patients become addicts when they get opioids, right? Big surprise. So let's talk about like an acute pain injury because it does make a difference when we're talking about chronic pain. So what happens when you have an initial injury? There are like three phases, in, in, um, initial injury, validation, and response. And it's kind of, kind of obvious, but I actually teach this to my patients. So the next thing that happens is you cut your finger while you're cutting carrots in the kitchen. Shit happens. So damage has occurred and your brain tells you where it is. It's your finger, right? So, okay, how it's bad. Your brain not knowing the extent of the damage goes, something bad has just happened to my finger and I'm holding a sharp knife in my hand. It's close to the blade. I better take a look at this, right? And so you take a look at it. That's what we call validation. You see something like this. You know, you're gonna put your knife down. You may actually decide you're gonna go see somebody about this or you may just pass out, right? So, you're doing that second step is an important step, it's a validation phase. Now, if you see something like this, you go, gee whiz, no big deal. You know, go on with your life, right? Now, on the other hand, if instead of cutting yourself, you know, basically you injured like your back, you're picking up a big heavy package, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, something hurts. So you kind of do your little hula dance, and if everything is okay, forget it. But all of a sudden, you get a sharp pain that goes right into your toe from your back, and you're going, that's a whole different story. So your response to that is going to be completely different. So I just want to spend a, little, a minute about messaging versus healing. Our life experience has always been that when you get tissue healing, it determines what our brain feels, right? So there's actually two independent processes. So healing is an automatic process. You don't have to think about your white cells, you know, doing whatever they do to heal yourself. But messaging and healing, they happen at the same time, but they do not necessarily inform each other. So all of you, you know, know about mobilization, remodeling, and consolidation. You don't have to think about that kind of stuff. The next thing that happens is messaging. And I'm just going to skip through this fairly quickly. So messaging and healing happen at the same time, but they're not necessarily informing one another. So after injury, the healing process will start automatically, but your pain experience which is, a, again, an emotional experience as well, won't necessarily use the information from the healing process, which you're not aware of, to determine your level of pain. You say, geez, you know, it's really healing, it doesn't really hurt. That doesn't happen, right? So what, so what happens when healing is not complete? There's more waiting, more testing, more treatment. You know, I'm going through that right now with my hip replacement, which didn't work out so well. And while all of this time passes, the pain becomes chronic. So now I am now a chronic pain patient, right? because it's been a year since my hip replacement and I'm not doing well. So one last thing, what's incomplete healing? So when your patient, let's say this patient broke their hip, they got some plates on it, and they are a little more active because they took too much opioids and they overdid things. So now they have incomplete healing and they really, you know, the surgeon did their best, but it's incomplete healing. Imperfect healing is like when you get a scar on your skin, all of us have scars. Well, that happens inside your body and in your cervical spine, in your lumbar spine, everywhere, and in your hip. Or the other thing, look at this guy. Um, he's putting all his weight on his right leg because thinks he's still hurting, and now he's going to have pain in his wrist and his shoulders, which is the kind of patients I see, among other things. 
Chronic pain misunderstanding. Pain means new or potential damage. Not quite right. Brain can misinterpret harmless sensory information and evidence of tissue damage and cause unnecessary pain. Less pain means better health, right? Well, it turns out it's not true. Medications mask the pain, but they are not cured, and many times they create many more problems than they solve. It doesn't mean I'm a nihilist. I do prescribe pain medications, which we'll get to eventually, but this is a real problem. So a lot of my patients say, I can't do it, okay? And what I tell them is there are ways to adapt and reestablish your previous roles. I tell patients, don't ever use the word can't unless you're paralyzed. I say, I don't want to because it hurts. I don't want to because I'll get more further injury. I don't want to because my doctor told me not to do it. Whatever it is, don't use the word can't. So the next one is the great big thing, the seduction of a cure. Well, guess what? There is no cure for chronic pain. Um, but you can learn to manage and have a very happy life, and I'm extremely happy with my life despite my chronic pain. So let's go on next to the Institute of Medicine report, which was commissioned by the NIH. It's a blueprint for transforming prevention, care, and education research of chronic pain. Uh, two of the 19 people on the panel were Dr. Sean Mackey, who's the current director of the pain, Stanford Pain Service, as well as Dr. Pizzo, who was the former dean of Stanford. Uh, like most IOMM reports, they are highly flawed. Um, it's not perfect. A lot of nine out of the 19 people on the panel have de various degrees of ties to the pharmaceutical industry. Some of them probably not that problematic, others yes, but it's worth a read if you're going to treat chronic pain. So what did they tell us? That chronic pain affects one in three adult Americans, more than heart disease, diabetes, and cancer combined. One third of the persons with chronic pain report their pain is disabling. Chronic pain can become a disease in its own right, and it costs a lot of money to do it. So whatever the number, actual numbers and patients, number of patients and the cost of society, and again, I don't believe all these numbers, but they're somewhere in the same ballpark. We know that chronic pain is a big problem. We know that the opioid epidemic is a big problem. And there's a tremendous collision course because everybody perceives the only way to treat pain is with drugs, right? So what did they find out? There's too much suffering, disability, interventionalism, that means a lot of injections, medications and medicalization, too many drugs being prescribed for pain, barriers to effective care that are geographic barriers, socioeconomic barriers, racial barriers, and ethnic barriers, and um, opioid-related adverse effects, including addiction and diversion. And there was too little of uh, functional recovery, emphasis on education and on skills development, promotion of integrative health, which, by the way, that's what I do, so I'm a big fan of this thing, and understanding and support from society and from, guess what, even providers and from your own family. So what do we need? What is the principles are? So research and education hopefully lead to prevention, just like same thing in addiction. Pain alleviation, but not palliation. This is not cancer pain. Improve function, improve productivity, improvement of quality of life. Premium non rocere. First, my aunt told me, by the way, my Charlotte said, you don't speak Latin? My, my nephew is an ignoramus. She came from a different background as a physician. First, do no harm. And management versus cure, just like diabetes mellitus is a chronic disease and addiction is a chronic disease. Once something becomes chronic, you can manage it, but rarely cure it. So this is now we're getting closer to what pain management today is. And I put it in a particular order. My particular order would be personally personal management. I'll describe what it is in a minute. Next thing is psychological care. Next thing is physical therapy, which means what you do as a patient, not what I do to you or a physical therapist does to you. Procedures, which I don't particularly like, but there are some procedures that help people avoid certain drugs. And the last and worst and most complicated, in my, my opinion, is pharmaceuticals, and I'm not just talking about opioids. So yes, I do prescribe, and I've helped a lot of people with judicious use of a particular medication. I don't have the time to go and share my whatever 30 years or 40 years of experience doing this, and a lot of this is available, but just be aware that pharmaceuticals are a big problem. So what, in the 70s, procedures were king. They are still the highest income generators. You can make thousands of dollars in an hour doing, being an interventionalist. Um, pharmaceuticals, are, are, again, remember, are not just opioids. And let me tell you a little about personal management. So personal management is having skin in the game, being responsible for a healthy diet, sleep cycle, cleaning up the mess in your life, you know, steps four through 11. You know, so it's kind of first three, you know, are acceptance of your pain, just like in, you know, AA, four through 11 is cleaning up the mess in your life. And, you know, again, acceptance, letting go of the anger. I used to bitch at my wife when I was hurt. 
you know, I love my wife, why am I screaming at her, right? Um, getting educated about medications that, put you, that you put in your body, developing an internal locus of control, and not looking for others to fix you like they wanted to do a three-level fusion with a tibial strut graft and a posterior craniotomy for me, and I said, no, thank you. Engaging heartily in PT and psychological approaches is what a functional restoration program about, and that's my bias because that's what, I'm, what's what I, I do. So your patient is no longer your annuity, but an educated, informed consumer of medical services. So let's talk about a little bit about um, physical therapy. So when I first walked into Eric Kandel's lab, he asked me this question. So why don't trees have a brain? I had no clue. Anybody have a clue? Anyway. So the reason trees don't have a brain is because they don't need to move. So any creature that needs to move needs to have a brain. So PT, so I used to, in my other life in Israel, we used to take dance and music, so I used, I used to dance, and I used to study with a guy who had a t-shirt said, never stop moving. So I tell my patients the same thing. The biggest thing that hurts people with chronic pain is all the other parts of your body that get injured because you're not moving. So you gotta move, okay? So that's essentially what, what PT is about, and then you need to learn how to do it on your own. So let's look at PT and rehab and personal management. If the patient with chronic pain is actively abusing a substance, meaningfully engaging in physical therapy is almost impossible. Their life is in chaos, okay? So I took a chance on a recovered alcoholic who was on large doses of opioids and put him through my FRP and I was gonna plan on weaning him off his opioids, actually just detox him in, in a couple of days. So one day he comes in and he's like looking really good but I smell alcohol in his breath so, and he's, but he's like functioning really well with the trainers and his BAC was 0.46, not 0.046, okay? So I admitted him to an inpatient alcohol detox, and, and, and as Anna mentioned, like Stanford doesn't do alcohol detox, which is insane, right, for an academics. I was doing it as a medical student at Bellevue. It's not rocket science, right? So anyway, so I admit him to a Sutter hospital, and I go to visit him. He has a bag of oranges in his room, and those of you who know something about addicts, you go, like, very suspicious. So I tasted one of them, and he had not injected him all of them with vodka, right? So... PT is education and what you, the patient does for the rest of her life, not what somebody does to you. If the patient with chronic pain is in recovery, you gotta pay attention to their medical consequences. One of my close skiing buddies uh, became, I didn't, I didn't just didn't pay attention that he was an alcoholic. His wife calls me, he's on life sports in, in ICU with cardiomyopathy from alcohol. So the, there's a protein problem. PT obviously is a big issue with some of these patients, but you can always work around it. So psychological therapy, you can read that on your slides on your own. Sorry, and I'm gonna go talk a little bit about it though. So, if the patient with chronic pain is actively abusing substances, they ideally should be detoxified prior to engagement in psychological approaches, because you do need a brain and you need to think clearly. Thinking, thinking will not get you there. But that may be not always be possible. Certainly an attempt to engage a patient in psychological treatment is worthwhile, so they can agree to be detoxified. If they're in recovery, attention must be given to their psychiatric and neurological consequences, because Long-term substance abuse, even if you're in long-term recovery, may have impacted, unfortunately, your cognition, memory, and reasoning, and sometimes you need to do a neuropsychiatric evaluation. So this is a slide from Beth Darnell. So, you know, depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder cause pain. Next thing, it goes the other way as well, so it's bi-directional. And this is kind of a slide I put together on pain psychology. So chronic non-cancer patient, patients engage in a range of maladaptive cognitive and emotional sides. You don't have to be an addict to do that, just any chronic pain patients that commonly lead to maladaptive behaviors and treatment failure. It may also lead to aberrant behaviors when you're on opioids or other scheduled drugs. Leading the pack is catastrophizing. At the core of catastrophizing is a concept of irrationally negative forecast of the future, like my pain will never go away. It's characterized by feeling of helplessness, rumination, and excessive magnification of cognitions and feelings towards the painful stimulus. I'm not talking about malingering. It's about what happens in all patients and can lead to aberrant behaviors and treatment failure. I find impulsivity and victimization extremely problematic, especially when both are present. Patients who are impulsive may decide to take all their opioids at once or just stop taking them and arrive on my doorstep with a cow score of 40 in absolutely flagrant uh, withdrawal symptomatology, like puking their guts out. So some patients come to me thinking, well, he's a specialist, I'm, go I'm gonna double down on their dose, right? Because I understand what their previous provider did not. They believe they're terminally unique, which is a term I borrow, all of you know from AA. Patients who cannot understand the difference between acceptance, 
whether it's addiction or whether it's pain between acceptance and giving up can be very hard to treat. It may present significant behavioral problems on opioids. Pain is inevitable in life, but pain may, without acceptance, leads to suffering. So interventional pain, I am certainly not going to go into the details of inter I left that behind. I haven't picked up a needle in anger since 1996. Plus, I'm no longer as dexterous as I used to be with, since my injury. So my first pain doctor, who was a neurotic Jew like me, but was in Vietnam and converted to Buddhism, uh, asked me the question. So ask, when, you, when you're doing a procedure, when you pick up a needle, ask yourself, are you all in or are you all out, Gabriel? There's no halfway. So this is the best advice I ever got from anybody. So when you stick a needle in a patient, you, you're all in, you break it, you own it. I'm not talking about the needle. You break the patient, you own that patient. So think long and hard before you stick a needle in a patient or implant a device in anyone, but especially in somebody with a significant psychiatric diagnosis. Most chronic pain patients are the very least depressed and anxious, but that doesn't mean they're not good candidates because they may be, you know, they have their anxiety and depression under control. An actively abusing addict, I said, somebody living in chaos, you do not want it. They can't manage any of this stuff. They won't come back when you tell them to come back. They may have some terrible consequence and you won't know about it. A patient in recovery may be a great candidate depending, again, on their medical and psychological comorbidities that happened before one they were using, but they're now stuck with in recovery. So a patient with what I call La Santissima Trinita, or the Holy Trinity of Issues, I happened to go to Jesuit school for a while, don't ask why. Um, they're an unstable psychiatric diagnosis and active SUDs is absolutely not a candidate for a procedure. So let's talk about complementary, and I hate the term, alternative medicine. Okay, I don't know what it is. Having trained and practiced acupuncture and studied TCM herbs and practiced yoga for about 40 years and meditation, I don't find anything alternative about it. It's just a different belief system. So I've recommended prayer therapy to on several occasions and with the help of some of my Jesuit priest colleagues, I've actually observed a, um, uh, well, I won't, I won't go into that, it's too weird. <laughs> some, of, some, of, some of my patients believe they were possessed by a devil, so they had a, a little process that's kind of weird and antiquated. So as a young anesthesiologist, I used to provide anesthesia for ECT, and there was a nun in a local convent who one of my psychiatrist colleagues uh, did ECT on 23 times for catatonic depression. And while my father got really well after two, I couldn't bear watching this poor nun not getting one iota better. So I went to visit the mother superior, and I convinced her to take their sister to Lourdes, and she was cured. I'm seriously cured. So I received holiday greetings from the mother superior for years on the Jewish New Year until, she, until this mother superior passed away. So acupuncture is a procedure, herbs and nutraceuticals are pharmacology, and don't under, under, underestimate the potency of ch traditional Chinese medicine herbs. I know enough not to give it and reserve, reserve for my friends who actually are true acupuncturists and practice both acupuncture and at part of it. I'm not suggesting if you just put needles in, you don't practice acupuncture, but giving TCM medications is a whole medical base of knowledge. Um, MBSR meditation is a psycho psychological approach and Ki Jong is PT. So this is kind of, now we're finally getting to what I'm supposed to talk about. One of my colleagues who started the uh, pain fellowship at Stanford, Bill Bros, had a slide that says, how do we treat pain in America? But I changed that. How do we treat anything in America, right? We use drugs. So lest you think that only opioids are overprescribed and cause problems, Depression, we prescribe antidepressants, ADHD stimulants, general anxiety disorder, SRIs and benzos, social phobia, antidepressants, insomnia, Z drugs and benzos. And in my experience, every patient gets a benzo when they're on opioid. I don't know why. Not for me or not anybody else that I work with. Common cold, antibiotics, GERD, PPIs. And by the way, you can get very serious adverse effects from PPIs instead of just telling the patient to change their diet, cut out the pepperoni pizza, not smoke, not drink. And for pain, we use opioids. Over the past two decades, the use of antidepressants have skyrocketed. One in 10 Americans now takes an antidepressant medication. Among women in their 40s and 50s, the figure is close to one to four. Maybe because men are jerks, I don't know. The vast majority of individuals diagnosed with depression, rightly or wrongly, were given medication. Ironically, the ones that actually need it don't get it. So just a word on benzos. Frankly, most of my patients who are in long-term recovery describe it go, getting off heroin as a cakewalk compared to uh, getting off benzos, especially alprazolam and especially clonazepam. If you want to read a great book called Death Grip by Matt Samet, um, I can't I highly recommend it. It was a mountain climber who got addicted to clonazepam. 
So personally, after working in this field for a while, I'd much rather be shooting heroin than clonazepam. Meth is another story. So re I gotta get, tell you about this one case. Recently acquired a 67 year old patient. She looked like a well-dressed school teacher who's highly respected psychiatrist in Palo Alto, who Anna probably knows, was treating her for bipolar disorder. And as a psychiatrist, you should know that up to 60% of your patients who have bipolar disorder have a substance use disorder. I'd say all of them, but up to that number. So this is what the medication consisted of. Latuda, Lamictal, Prozac, Cytomil, Provigil, Lorazepam, Clonazepam, and Zul Zulpidem. Frankly, I'm not a psychiatrist, but that is absurd, okay? Her equally well-trained and respected pain physician who'd never communicated with the psychiatrist nor the vice versa, the patient had two cervical fusions, cervicogenics, he was giving her 20 milligrams a day with oxycodone, which is not that much, but five butalbitols. It's a barbiturate, hello. So this is equally absurd. Butalbitol is highly addictive, and again, she's getting lorazepam, clonazepam, zolpin, and nabutabol, butalbitol. And it actually makes your headaches chronic. So I was just suspicious because she is bipolar. So I asked for a urine specimen, can't pee. I made her sit in my office for four hours, and then she could pee and she gave me two drops. Well, guess what I found? Fenteramine and meth, not like a contaminant. This is liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectroscopy. I'm not saying she's a meth addict. She didn't look like a meth addict. She didn't have skin picking. She had her teeth. She was obese, but she was using meth for whatever reason. That doesn't make her an addict, and we'll talk about uh, urine drug testing later if we ever get a chance. So now we finally get on slide 50 to what these drugs are about. And the moral of the story is when you got so many drugs for chronic pain, why? It's because none, each one of them doesn't necessarily work and it's trial and error. We're not in the genomics phase. I mean, yes, I've had patients who I've given to with severe chronic regional pain syndrome where their arm looked like an elephant trunk and they were severely depressed and suicidal, and I gave this lady 10 milligrams of the Zipramine, and life was pretty damn good. You won't see that all the time, but so you got to know about all these different drugs that are available. So this is, you can look at this, it's a kind of a busy slide, but it shows you where drugs work, you know. There's the brain, there's the spinal cord, which is central, there's the peripheral, local, and there's something called DNIC, descending noxious inhibitory control, and that's a whole five hour lecture, I'm not gonna go into it. So medications convert locally to reduce pain by decreasing inflammation and decreasing the signal from the site of tissue injury or centrally to reduce pain by make, mimicking endogenous chemicals and altering the nerve processing. The nervous system is the communication system and doctors use medications to affect different parts of the nervous system to influence the final pain experience when that nociceptive, remember, hits the brain and becomes conscious and then it becomes pain. Pain medication just masks the pain. Again, I'm not a nihilist. I do prescribe pain medications. Okay, by attempting to block or modify the nociceptive single signal that reaches the brain, but there is no disease modification unless you got rheumatoid arthritis and you're taking disease modifying drugs that can kill you. This is just a cool slide. You can look at it later. And so let's talk about this. This is kind of important. This is where I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. So pretty much all you need to know about drugs is the devil is always in the details. Start low and go slow. When I first became an anesthesiologist, it's the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid, until you figure things out and get more sophisticated. Start one drug at a time. If I have a cancer patient, I give him five drugs at a time. I'll give him, a ben I'll give him even a benzo, okay? You know, I'll give him anything I get my hands on because they may die in two months and they, they don't want to die in agony. Some patients uh, don't want drugs, okay, even when they're dying. Um, get, get to know two drugs or one or two drugs from each class. The discussion of whether or, or how to give opioids to a person with an SUD is too long. But for acute pain, yes, but only under direct observation and it's still nuanced. Chronic pain and a substance use disorder in recovery, patients usually don't want opioids. Even if alcoholics in recovery said, no doc, I don't want it. I said, but you just had like major surgery. No, I don't want any opioids. Uh, but there are several options, and if they would benefit from them and want opioids, it could be done safely. For chronic pain in active substance use disorders, this is a long discussion, but there are options. Remember that no patient, even without substance use disorder, gets opioid monotherapy. They get the five Ps that we talked about. So a few words about some of these drugs. So there's, let me start about codeine and tramadol. Many of you who treat kids may be aware that recently that codeine and morphine don't, I mean, codeine and tramadol are not pain relieving, it's their metabolites that are active. So if you're an ultra rapid metabolizer in your child and you're opioid naive, you will die if you get codeine and tramadol. 
So the other thing is there are a lot of adults who are ultra-rapid metabolizers of, of tramadol, and those people can have a risk for addiction. So not everyone who's an ultra-rapid metabolizer, you need other risk factors. So I happen to know something about Gaza. My business partner in my tech company was also Palestinian. And there's a gigantic tramadol epidemic in Gaza. I mean, you, it's the size of the heroin epidemic here and maybe larger. You know, um, as an Israeli, I feel responsible for it. We made life miserable for a lot of these people in, in Gaza. But again, so what do you do when you have stress and misery? You get drugs and they come in through Egypt, this tramadol. And if you're, not all Arabs are addicts, not all Arabs are ultra rapid metabolizers, but if you are, you're gonna get a huge buzz of this. And after a while, it just becomes what you take to feel normal. Okay, nobody, nobody takes drugs to f get high anymore once you're an addict. You're just doing it to be normal and avoid withdrawal. The other reason I don't pre uh, prescribe Ramadol to hardly uh, to any addict is because they cause seizures after 400 milligrams. And I have patients who take 4,000 milligrams a day and they seize in my office, but in one particular case she says, yeah, but my husband isn't the a-hole that he usually is when I'm seizing, right? So um, let's talk about some other drugs. So let me go back to the slide, and this is important. So why do I prescribe oxymorphone or hydromorphone? Because they're expensive. Um, and so if I give somebody oxycodone and I find oxymorphone in the urine, you will because it's a metabolite, and I worry about them. I give them the end product, which is oxymorphone, because then if I find oxycodone in their urine, it doesn't go back the other way. Somebody's copying oxycodone somewhere. Same thing with, with hydromorphone. You get morphine, and I find hydromorphone, but I'm a little nervous. I say, no, let's switch to hydromorphone, and then when I still find morphine in urine, we got a problem. Methadone is a great drug, and the methadone treatment program is cheap, it's effective, but none of my patients listen to me or to any other doctor, so I have a little 85-year-old lady, post herpetic neuralgia, two and a half milligrams of methadone. I tell her son, one week, two and a half milligrams, call me, we'll talk, because they live far away. I just wasn't, no more, two and a half, because it adds up, it can have a half-life up to 100 hours. I call them up, oh, mom's on 20 milligrams of methadone. And I'm going, that's why I don't prescribe methadone. Levorfenol is really not available. It was similar to methadone in many ways. It's actually a great opioid if you are going to get benefit from it postoperatively, but I don't, you just can't get it. Fentanyl, great drug in the OR. I never give it to my patients because it's a huge problem. And, and the ultra rapid one, again, I don't want to lose my license. It's meant for cancer patients. I don't give it off label. Buprenorphine is a great drug, but it has problems if we overuse it, which we'll talk about again. I don't want it to become a Schedule II drug again, but it's, it's very nuanced and extremely useful, and I use a lot of it in a very selective way, both for pain patients, addicts, and patients in both who are bridge the gap. Adjuvants, I never prescribe a benzo. There's zero literature to prescribe benzos long-term. Short-term, yes, but what happens is once they're on short-term, they're on long-term, whether it's these drugs or benzos. Corticosteroids, a lot of doctors make a lot of money injecting people. It's their 401k plan. If you take a menopausal woman uh, it give and do a lot of it, you can get psychotic depression. I've had a couple of my patients who are that class die of suicide uh, when they became psychotically depressed from a, a corticosteroid happy injection doctor. Mixilatine, I've never seen it help anybody. Naltrexone is in low doses of four milligram, can be useful as a glial cell modifier for patients with fibromyalgia and some other disorders. I've actually taken patients off opioids and instead of buprenorphine, put them on a low dose naltrexone for their pain, not Vivitrol, naltrexone for uh, opioid use disorder. And cannabis, yes, but not dapping. You people know what dapping is. So dapping is a way to get 80% THC, you concentrate it, you heat it up to a lot of stuff. A lot of my patients do that. That's not low CBD, high THC medicinal marijuana, okay? With cannabis, you know, in my kibbutz, we actually grow marijuana of specific CBD content, and I go back and I see these little old, little old, I'm their age, and they're sitting there with these big bags, and they're sucking on this thing, and it's way better than other stuff I could prescribe for them, and they're happy campers. Anticonvulsants, gabapentin and pregabalin. Again, oh, well, I forgot to mention one thing. Don't ever prescribe a, a patient, an addict, with a drug that has street value. So gabapentin and pregabalin have used street value, um, and I'll, and, and, when pregabalin first came out, you needed a triplicate formula, formula for it. I had one patient who was an, a recovered meth addict, and I could give him 25 milligrams of pregabalin or Lyrica, and he's high as a kite. And he didn't want to be that way, but it took all his pain away. So we ended up breaking the capsule, took a razor, and 10 milligrams was just right to relieve his pain, but not get him high because he didn't want to go there anymore. Um, Anti-inflammatories, uh, again, 
hugely potentially problem long term because my patients on it never want to come off. And what happens is high doses every day as they get older, it'll destroy multiple organ systems. But it can be useful, but make sure that it actually is useful. The clofenac is poison unless you have a big effusion. I mean, it's, it's one of, I think in my mind, one of the most toxic NSAIDs, but if for three days it's wonderful. If you have a big effusion, it'll bring it right down, generally speaking. Antidepressants. I happen to love the Zipramine, but that's my bias. Uh, I use it as an activating agent because my, I want my patients to go back to work. My patients have poor sleep, and I, I use nortripline, which is a depressant. Um, and I use this both for depression and both for chronic pain, but I don't play psychiatrist. I only treat mild forms of depression in my patients that are related to their pain. If they've got bipolar disorder or severe or the depression, that's why we have psychiatrists. I know my limits. Um, Amitriptyline, I've never found a patient who liked it, and so I've not had a good result with it. Uh, I use Pristique as well, Desuenoflaxin. Deloxetine is a great drug, but I prefer the TCAs because they have a fewer numbers to treat, like two to three for both depression and for, but especially for chronic pain. Um, but Deloxetine is like six, so I'd rather go with the heart stuff because I'm watching the patient, and then if they have a side effect, I'll switch to Deloxetine, but it can give you hypertension, or if your patient has hypertension, I would most likely, I personally don't use deloxetine when a patient is hypertensive. Bupropion, big time street value. Patients inject it. If you ever want to see something, the grossest thing you've ever seen in your life, and I used to see a lot of skin poppers with heroin, that is nothing compared to somebody shooting bupropion. And because there's no better pharmacologist than an addict, uh, they use large numbers, amounts of pregabalin and gabapentin so they don't seize. Because essentially it works like meth. It's like cocaine, it's a first like a cocaine ride and then it's a meth ride. Okay, so. now, uh, look at dopamine and endorphin. Uh, how long did it stay in your body? Seconds and minutes. That's because we have a beautiful body. It's whatever you believe in God or evolution, it's an amazing organism. So, but all the drugs we give, and these are not the long-acting ones, take hours. So what do they do? They tell your body not to make endorphin and your, and your opioid receptors to not regulate. That's a big problem. So that is why I personally never prescribe a long-acting opioid, despite what, I was, what, I, what is taught and pushed by pharma and many in academia who publish but do not treat. When I got to Stanford in 2006, everybody goes, oh no, you gotta give long-acting opioids because short-acting opioids are highly addictive. And I'm going, you guys are insane. I said, it makes no sense. It never made sense to me. What I certainly don't do is combine both of them, short-acting and long-acting. Um, next thing is, the drugs on the bottom is what doctors prescribe, and the drugs are the, on the top is what nature or God gave us. So again, it's obvious. The problem is suppression of endorphin, suppression of dawn regulation. So when you actually have the cycle that I was taught was anathema, why would you want to have pa patients go through this up and down cycle of pain? Well, I don't have pain the same day. All patients who are not cancer patients, their pain cycle changes during the day. You know, your wife or your kid smiles at you and your pain is a little less. You get into a fight with your wife or you kind of, somebody hits you from the rear or somebody cusses you out and gives you the finger and cuts you off, your pain is worse. So why would I want to be on the same level of opioid all day long? It absolutely makes no sense. So many patients have already been on multiple medications and high dose medications by the time they see me, but many times when they come see you as well, even if you're not a chronic pain um, medicine specialist. The usual patient is not sure which medications do what. They've been on it for years. They have no idea why they're on it anymore. So the real issue is most patients do not think critically about their medications use, why they're taking, how long they're gonna take it for, is it helpful or not, and if doctors know what to do, we don't have time. I mean, you know, in my practice, I can talk to patients for hours. I don't really care. But in most places like Stanford and other places, you got somebody says 15 minutes, you know, and you, don't, and, and you don't have time to teach your patients to think critically about this. So patients come to you and say, okay, why should I take this medication? So I actually have shared medical appointments, which is, you know, they do that at PAMF. I, I got like 20 patients in a room and I talk about undesired effects. I, I talk about what they actually are, and I do that in, I don't, I'm not trying to talk my patients out of taking medications. I make a living prescribing medications, but again, judiciously and be thinking twice what I'm doing. And then, so how can you, as a provider, tell if a medication is helping your patient or not? How can you tell the best dose of medication to prescribe to a patient? You have to measure things, right? So what are you gonna measure? Pain, re pain relief, satisfaction, quality of life, that's subjective, right? It's not that I don't trust my patient, but how are you gonna measure it? Physical health and mental health are partly subjective too, 
what I would suggest to you that function is not something, and, and productivity is something you can measure. So I measure vocational productivity, social productivity, and recreational productivity, essentially having a normal life that you say, yes, it's okay to get up in the morning, I got something to wake up for, right? So the other thing is you only, you, you get what you inspect. If you don't know what you're looking for, if you don't know what to expect for, you gotta look for stuff in patients. So I, I have a patient, you know, is 80 years old, she comes into me, and she's got a radiculopathy, and she probably needs an operation, but she's 80 years old, and her husband without her is gonna die. He's 90 years old. So I start her on gabapentin. I think I got her 100 milligrams, and a week later I put her on a, another 100 milligrams, because I start really low. Any of you who start patients on 300 of gabapentin TID, you're looking for deep trouble. You'll get away with it 90% of the time, but I've knocked out people, healthy young men, who weigh 250 pounds and are six foot four, 100 milligram, and they just, get dizzy, they can't wake up in the morning. Just trust me, it's a dangerous drug. So I give her 200 milligrams of Neurontin. She doesn't come back for a while. She comes back looking like she has elephantiasis. I said, how come you didn't come back? He said, well, my pain is gone, but I can take care of my husband, all right? So you gotta be careful with all these things. You need to, I should have told her, like an idiot, I forgot to tell her, if your legs swell, which a lot of people have, stop taking the medications. But I forgot to tell her, because I figured I was only 100 milligrams, right? So I learned from that stupidity. So basically, we look at the desired effect. We also look at undesired effects. And then we look at the balance of the two. So now very quickly, oh, one more thing, toxicity. You're playing the roulette wheel. You know, and what's toxicity? General specific, acute or chronic, maybe persistent. Think about NSAIDs and antipsychotics for long-term benefits, even if you stop them, and, requ and requires monitoring for safe use. So let's talk very fast about opioids. Uh, sorry about that. Um, hydrocodone should have been made a Schedule II drug from the get-go, not in 2014. And buprenorphine, yes, buprenorphine is an opioid. I've got pain doctors not far from here, I won't mention names because it's too close, who tell them, congratulations, you're off opioids, you're on buprenorphine, great. It's highly abused. I got patients who shoot buprenorphine. I got patients who shoot buprenorphine naloxone. I don't ever use the word suboxone because I hate the term. It's a brand name that's supporting a company that has a lot of issues. Um, and so, next, REMS, risk, uh, risk evalu evaluation and mitigation strategies. Again, it's a long talk, but it's a joke in solving the opioid epidemic, as the FDA, in my opinion, even prior to this administration, is a tool of the pharma industrial complex. My tech company service pretty much every major pharma company, but I'm still not a big fan of big pharma. I hardly ever prescribe long-acting opioids, but never a long-acting and a short-acting because there is no such thing as breakthrough pain. You just got the wrong tool, okay? Yes, people have breakthrough pain. I have breakthrough pain every day, but giving short-acting and long-acting opioids makes zero sense. Um, I don't rotate opioids. Rotating opioids is what people prescribe. Well, if oxycodone work, maybe hydromorphone will work, BS and that's a sure way to kill your patient if you don't know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing, and I still don't do it. I would never rotate opioids on a, on a substance patient with substance use disorders. I'll skip the, the slide on, on Purdue because we're not running out of time, but I don't prescribe Butrans because Purdue, I don't want to rant about Purdue. Be aware there's a new version called Mundi Pharma that's gonna bring the joys of safe OxyContin to the, race, the rest of the world, which you may not have heard of Mundi Pharma, but keep your eyes open. Um, so th let's see if we have time for this, and you can, want to shut me off, you can. Um, among the remedies, which has please almighty God to give man to relieve his sufferings, none is so universal and efficacious as opium. This is Sydenham. Uh, it took him 30 years to get his MD after he graduated from, Har from Oxford, and people read his, his uh, textbooks for two centuries. This I love. This is from Collins, who is an excellent writer, who is brilliant. Who was the man who invented laudanum, which is tincture of opium, which we treat kids with near abs absence syndrome? I thank him from the bottom of my heart. I've had six delicious hours of oblivion. I've woken up with my mind composed. I've written a perfect little letter. And all through the modest little ball of drops, which I see on my bedroom, chimney piece of this moment drops, you are my darling. I love nothing else. This, I, you've got problems, dude, all right? All right, so. So let's give a hand. Um, thank you so much.